Welcome everyone to the first of the Winter Quarter Porter Forest series and to the introduction to our visiting scholar in the Urban Humanities Initiative this quarter, Eric Kasdan. I'll introduce him in a minute. We're lucky to have him with us for a week and you'll have many opportunities to be exposed to his scholarship and perspective. There are quite a few things happening in the Urban Humanities Initiative. I see a lot of our Urban Humanities students are here, maybe all of them, that's wonderful to see, as well as visiting faculty and students from other parts of campus. Um, the Urban Humanities Initiative is sponsored by the Mellon Foundation and is a three-year undertaking looking at collective life in megacities as a kind of um, uh, excuse, in a way, to bring together parts of our campus and parts of our logics that rarely intersect design, uh, urbanism, and the humanities. And I think those of you who are part of it will agree with me that it's been an incredible journey thus far. We're only in our first year, but it's been a remarkable series of explorations. And I'm really pleased to say that I think Eric Kasdan would fit in with our way of thinking beautifully. And it's in fact uh, going to be very influential in this quarter's way of thinking. There are lots of activities that the Urban Humanities undertakes each quarter. <laughs> more than uh, the project coordinator Jonathan Christman and I can practically manage, along with our fellow uh, PIs, Diane Fogger, who's here. Uh, let's see, Todd Presner, who I expect will be here any minute, and the third of the four of us, if I'm the fourth, is um, Anastasia Nukaitu Sedaris. Our visiting professor for the year is Bill Marotti, sitting in the back, who um, not only represents our Japanese focus, because our year uh, theme city is Tokyo, but also brings together the arts and protest and risk, uh, things that we're exploring together collectively from these multidisciplinary perspectives. Okay, with that little pitch aside, what's coming up um, are many things. You're not gonna be able to get enough of Eric uh, through all the things that he's doing. Um, on Thursday evening from 5 to 7, he's speaking at the Experimental Critical Theory Program. Um, do you know the location of that? No. You'll be able to find it on the Urban Humanities website, or you can call us at Urban Humanities to find the location of that. Um, on Friday, we're going to screen the film by Chris Marker, Sans Soleil, here in the D Cafe. Everyone's welcome to come. Pizza provided. Um, Eric is going to be there to talk it through uh, if we want, or maybe we'll just have a beer and watch the film and talk about it later, depending on how people feel. Um, that should be 6 to 8. On Saturday, February 8th, um, I particularly want to call your attention to a symposium that Michael Osmond and three of our doctoral students have organized called Archiving Risk. It will be here in the D Cafe starting at noon. And it will culminate at 5.30 with a keynote speak, uh, talk by Jonathan Massey uh, on uh, Norman Foster's Gherkin building called, uh, the talk's called Risky Pickle. So that should be an uh, interesting um, evening and day. Okay, so on to our present uh, event. Um, the title of Eric's talk is Chronic Space Terminal Architecture, Building and Unbuilding the Future. And um, if that title seems uh, broadly based, it's because everything that Professor Kasdan undertakes ranges across disciplines and perspectives in unpredictable um, and highly productive ways intellectually. He has a PhD in literature from UC San Diego and was awarded most recently in 2012 the Mellon Foundation's New Directions Fellowship for a project called the Worldly Clinic. This reflects some work that I think we'll hear mildly about today, um, which is also part of his most recent book called, um, let me see if I get the title right, it's not The Walking Dead, which is what I keep thinking, but the already dead, so not unrelated. Um, uh, and let me just read you what uh, Frederick Jameson wrote about this text, because I think it's representative of the way Kasdan thinks about many of the topics he undertakes. This immensely ambitious and unclassifiable theoretical work begins by projecting a new kind of temporality, the chronic. 
out of medical practice in order to range across the political, the cultural, the national, the autobiographical, and the economic. Um, touching in passing on film and globalization, and in the process, unearthing new life forms, those all being the already dead, the undead, and the always already dead. It's an exciting new journey. Uh, if anyone, I think, can bring together The Walking Dead and the Twilight series with uh, Obamacare and the healthcare industry, it would be through the artistic rendering of that that Eric Kazin brings to his work. I was introduced to his work uh, through Catastrophe and a volume of the South Atlantic Quarterly that our students read recently called Disastrous Consequences, to which he contributed an essay that I've now come to see as one of his, uh, an example of his scholarly modus operandi. An event or an observation in the world, say Fukushima or Katrina, upends a conventional understanding for instance, that so-called crises are in fact the predictable result of a system working as intended, which then reveals a political economy and everyday practice that refigures our notions of the future and rewrites our conventional narratives. I think um, that notion of how you could pre present a new lens, a new interpretive frame, and then lead towards revolutionary new uh, possibilities, perhaps even utopian possibilities, is what um, makes us so happy to welcome Eric Kasdan into thinking about our urban humanities projects, which always have this speculative component. Today, Eric's gonna walk us through at least part of his perspective on architecture, and particularly architecture in Japan. So I ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Eric Kasdan. Uh, this mic is working. Okay. I have to put in my password, so no one should look. Okay. Thank you, Dana. That was very uh, generous and warm. I appreciate that very much, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I, I'm. I think the timing is really right, since I find that a lot of my work these days has been moving more towards questions of um, space, and I've been more interested in architecture, and so I think uh, the collaboration over the next few weeks, and I hope what can come after that as well, is something that uh, I'm really looking forward to. And, and I want to thank Dana, who's been incredibly uh, gracious and welcoming um, uh, to me, and I looking forward to collaborating more with you, and to Jonathan, uh, who's really helped me think through what I'm going to do over the next few weeks in, um, in the seminars, and how to really coordinate my own thinking to the, to the project here. And also to Kimberly, who has really been uh, incredibly uh, confident and, and, and helpful in dealing with all the logistics. So thanks a lot. I appreciate that. So here, here's my idea. I have uh, two films that I've made explicitly for this talk. Uh, the first one is going to set up what uh, what I'm going to be moving through in the next uh, in, in, through the course of my remarks, um, and it's about eight minutes. And in it, there's just a lot of material, um, images and arguments, ideas, um, text, sound, that I uh, will then work with. And it should function as a kind of chamber, maybe a, a preemptive echo chamber, where these things should come back after um, what, while I'm talking about them. And then after, there's a coda, a one-minute film that um, I'll show. And then from there, I'm happy to take some questions. I, I'm going to try not to go on too long, but I also just don't feel like rushing, since it's so warm here in Los Angeles. And, and I, I, so I just feel like taking my time, and um, I'll try not to, to bore you uh, and, and come back and forth from just speaking and maybe reading a little bit. Uh, and uh, I'm going to move from questions of, of uh, what I'll call a historical trap, thinking about the future, questions about time. Um, I want to move through uh, the Japanese thinker Karatani Kojin, who I know um, there are many of you here who are familiar with. 
some of his previous work and some of his current work, uh, the architect Isozaki Arata, um, uh, the metabolists in Japan, some new designers, Fukushima, uh, the disaster, and then um, make an argument, uh, rather um, maybe somewhat um, counterintuitive argument, that and I hope we can develop and I can develop in the next couple of weeks. So with that being said, let's start with the film. Um, Thank you. 
to shut off at some point. And, uh, try not to uh, get distracted and find it. Should you? I want to begin then with the question where the film left off. Uh, how to make something for the future uh, that doesn't colonize that very future itself. And this is many times what we call an historical trap in which it seems as if we're only capable of acting for that which is in reach. If we could imagine a radically different future, then by definition, it's not a radically different future. It's just another symptom of our present. It's, the question then is, what do we do in the face of such a paradox? Are we destined to be uh, docile, destined to be dismissive of it, destined to be even decadent in the face of it? Probably, perhaps. But what I want to do today, then, is per present an alternative, what I'm going to call terminal architecture. Terminal architecture is not the end of architecture. It's not apocalyptic architecture. It's not airport terminal architecture. It's something else. Uh, at this point, it's certainly not a full-blown concept, and it's not a practice that I can imagine. It's just a provocation and one that I'm going to ask you to uh, collaborate in with me over the next few weeks, uh, for those of you who are going to remain around for the seminars and tr trying to develop this. Uh, and, and that's what I'd like to do partly with, with my time here, is, is push this even further. Uh, but let me start then by gesturing to it in advance by recalling or appropriating my, my favorite anecdote, something like an academic urban legend Maybe you've heard it before, it goes like this. There's a rather pedantic and uh, pompous professor lecturing in front of hundreds and hundreds of students in the full lecture hall. And um, the professor is, is lecturing about the grammatical abominations of the double negative. And, uh, and then at some point, as if struck by some brilliant theoretical insight, he asks the students, yeah, but what is a double positive? And the professor is luxuriating in the silence. And then from the back of the room, two students stand up and in unison yell out, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then proceed to leave the room to the horror of the professor and to the uh, delight, exhilaration, disbelief of, of, of the fellow students. What I like about this particular anecdote is that in the face of such an impossible and infuriating question, the students are forced to crack open a new possibility that doesn't exist, a possibility in a different register. In this case, the student's response shifts from that of uh, circumscribed reason to that of what something like a formal intervention or, or emancipated style. Uh, there's a number of things I'm interested about in the yeah, yeah, but for our purposes here, I think there's an important temporal and spatial dimension to it. Uh, first of all, the yeah, yeah is singular. It's not a solution you can repeat at different times to resolve further paradoxes or antinomies and possible questions. It works once, and then it doesn't work again. Secondly, I think there's a spatial dimension to it. What is that? I'm not so sure yet. That's what I want to pursue here. I know that there's a space that's called the lecture hall, and the students, after they yell the yeah, yeah, and leave it, they, um, they somehow reconfigure that space. They inflate it, they deflate it, they reconfigure it. Maybe they produce, by their own subtraction, another space somewhere else. And so I want to think about the relation between the yeah, yeah, and space, or more specifically, between the yeah, yeah, and terminal architecture. So first of all, then, we have to, I have to give you some sense of how I'm thinking about terminal architecture. And I want to do so by taking the two terms one by one. First the terminal and then architecture. Um, and the terminal uh, I'm using in connection to the book that Dana had mentioned earlier, The Already Dead, or The Walking Dead. Probably I get more residuals on The Walking Dead. Uh, um, uh, and how I think about um, terminality in that particular work, and how I'm trying to transfer that now to the questions of space and architecture. So what I'm doing in The Already Dead is I'm trying to track some key temporal 
the shifts in key temporal categories, um, such as uh, the terminal, the chronic, the acute, the mean time, crisis, and the meanings and effects of that shift. I begin by looking at what might be called dominant treatment paradigms um, within medical uh, research and practice, and tracking the shift from what was the dominant um, paradigm of cure to one I'm calling management. Uh, and most of my work at the beginning uh, is dealing with the, um, the treatment of, of, within the modern history of cancer care. So just to give you an example of this shift from cure to management, within the history, the modern history of cancer care, there are generally um, three forms of dominant treatment to deal with a tumor or a tumor load. One would be extracting the tumor, irradiating the tumor, or chemically annihilating the tumor. If it doesn't return, with any significance, then, it, what, then we have what's called a cure, capital C. Um, now, in many ways, that's still the dominant mode of, of cancer treatment today. But within the trenches where uh, cutting edge medical research, discourse, protocols, trials, together with pharmaceutical executives and others are working, there is a shift in which the aim is no longer to uh, uh, extract or eradicate to evacuate the tumor or tumor load, but to manage it into the indefinite future with so many um, advanced, technologically advanced drugs, many of which were that the research was gleaned from mapping the human genome um, and other genetics research and so forth. Now, there's nothing in principle, I think, with this <coughs> shift from cure to management um, uh, wrong with that. And, and, and I'm not really tracking that in the already dead. Rather, I set that up so then I can pursue the question of what might be the political implications of that kind of shift. So the analogy then is the cure is to management within the medical realm as revolution, or if you want a quainter, a less quaint term, maybe radical change is to reform or sustainability or management within political activism, political discourse, political theory. Um, now again, there's no, there's nothing, there's nothing in principle wrong with an emphasis on, on uh, management or reform or sustainability. But what I'm interested in is how the celebration of reform and management insinuates itself into the ways by which we can think about what's possible and what's impossible. And it's for that reason that I'm trying in that book to reclaim the categories of cure and revolution that themselves aren't necessarily medical and political categories, um, respectively, but affect all ways in which we um, uh, uh, live in the world and, and think in particular about, about the future. Uh, so I'm attempting to, to reclaim cure and revolution, and I do this by rethinking the category of the terminal, not as apocalyptic fantasy or a suicide wish, or by condoning how the state exploits terminality by uh, terrorizing us into um, uh, accepting all forms of sacrifice, terrorizing us with ends, our own, our own death, or social calamity, and so forth. Rather, I reclaim the terminal by stressing its utopian dimension. That is, how it contains the always existing possibility of the end of our present, and here I'm not just talking about our present lives, I'm talking about our present configuration of suffering, or our present configuration of unequal social relations, or our present configuration of, of, of the possible and the impossible. For me, a genuine engagement with terminality of all kinds is enlivening, not to mention psychologically, aesthetically, and politically radical, insofar that it opens up to profound change and to profound otherness. Now, I'm curious to know how my conceptualization of the terminal um, and this reclamation project of cure and revolution might relate to space, to the urban, to architecture, which leads me to ask the following question. If chronic time is the containment of the future in the name of the present, then what is chronic space? My preliminary answer is the containment of space by thinking about it only as something to be sustained, preserved, managed into the indefinite future. 
think here about the celebration of Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. That's the famous building, one of the few left standing after the great Kanto earthquake of 1923. Or think about the Metabolist Project, and I'm going to talk quite a bit more about the Metabolists in a bit, and their uh, project on, on building great megastructures that can adapt to a changing future. Now, in principle, again, there's nothing wrong, I think, with this desire to preserve the past and the present, as well as to preempt the threats of the future. But such a desire often functions to smuggle in, I think, specific ideologies of time, of space, and of change. Ones that, I argue, cancel out the future in the name of building for it. As an outsider to architecture and to urban studies, but as someone who's been intervening in these discourses over the past few years, my sense is that many practicing architects and designers, as well as urban theorists and historians, although oftentimes producing brilliant and inspiring work about and for the future, do not rigorously theorize time itself. And more specifically, do not carefully consider the very category of the future and how it is wholly contingent on the dominant ideologies of the present. That is, how the future is wholly contingent on the dominant ideologies of late capitalism. And this then takes me to architecture. By architecture, I want to follow an argument made by Karatani Koji in his work, Architecture as Metaphor. Um, and I think some of you I know might, are familiar with Karatani, uh, one of his uh, most impressive translator, Seiji Lippet, is here. Um, and you might know uh, uh, Karatani by way of his monumentally important work on modern Japanese literature, um, or maybe you know him for his more recent work, a much more philosophically, politically driven work, um, in which he's attempting to think uh, beyond, really, to what I've, in one way, to what I've set up as a historical trap, uh, beyond to what Karatani calls the trinity of capital nation and state. This was at the, behind his book Transcritique, in which he had a, a really inventive rereading of Kant and Marx um, for that project. And in his most recent book, um, Sekai Shino Kozo, which hasn't come out in English yet, but it's going to come out in a couple of months from Duke University Press, the modest title of uh, Structure of World History. Um, He's doing the same thing. He's trying to think about it beyond, and, and there he's theorizing, or he's, he's, he's trying to um, uh, speculate about what a world republic would be and, and the ways in which uh, nation, capital, and state must be understood in, 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 inextricably. Uh, and, and I'll touch more about that on, uh, in a bit, but you know, there's an interesting backstory to the recent work by Karatani's two books, and that has to do with architecture. At the beginning of architecture as metaphor, and this has a different, history, a different uh, trajectory in the Japanese as it does in the English. Um, in the English, it's a combination of different books in, in, in Japanese. But in the, in, at the beginning of the, in the English preface in the 90s to this book, Architecture as Metaphor, Katatani explains that it was we, or, or, or that, that it was dealing with architecture that has really produced a kind of intellectual. Um, breakdown for him, and that forced him into new ways of thinking that's now led to the contemporary work that he's doing. Part of that has to do with um, his influence from the certain, um, uh, a certain kind of deconstructive work. Um, he was close with Paul Demand and others, and, and, and the ways in which that started, the limits of that for him um, as being a non-Western intellectual, working through those problems. Um, and that the kind of formalization that he was involved in um, was no longer satisfying. And that when he was thinking about urban um, theorists and, and architects, there was a way of dealing with another, in this case, a financier or a patron or a design problem, that produced a kind of incommensurability between the, the speculation and the practical realities that was inspiring for Karatani and then pushed him into a different form of politics. Um, but uh, there was also uh, um, another aspect of the architecture book that's led to the contemporary work. And, and so I want to go back to that text, which I don't think um, people know that well, and, um, and give you a sense of how architect is, architecture um, is being represented there and then what I'm going to be doing with it. 
So in that work, Architecture is Metaphor, Karatani reminds us that in Plato's attempt to define the philosopher, he uses the architect as metaphor. Architecture for Plato is a making, a poesis, of something from nothing. And this making is an attempt to withstand becomings, disruptive changes, and terminations of all kinds. Architecture is understood, therefore, as the will to construct an edifice of knowledge on a solid foundation. This will to architecture asserts that the impossible be realized. And in this case, the impossible is the to be, or the taming of all contingency. And this will to architecture is for Karatani the foundation of Western thought. Architecture is the name through which the metaphysics that ground Western thought came into existence. And it is the target of Karatani's fierce critique. Ah, but this is where things get interesting. Because things are different in Japan. And, and this is what Karatani's experiencing. There, as the culture isn't based on a will to architecture. Rather, there are deconstructive forces constantly at work, driven by the dominant categories of absence, nothingness, negativity, the hallmarks of Buddhist thinking and practice. To be architectonic in Japan, therefore, Karatani argued, is actually radical and political. To be architectonic in the West was um, somewhat had a dubious, almost reactionary effect in, in the way that it was uh, grounding a certain metaphysics that Karatani was criticizing. Uh, so, Karatani was compelled to perform a dual role at once criticizing the dubious will to architecture as the foundation of Western thought, and at the same time, criticizing the dubious will to deconstruction as the foundation of Japanese thought. And this was confused even more when we realized that the history or the will to architecture had pervaded Japan throughout Japanese modernity, mm -hmm. just as the will to deconstruction has pervaded Western thought, most notably by so many post-Heideggerian thinkers like Derrida, or within literary theory, Roland Barthes, or even we can think about it in terms of the so-called postmodern turn in architecture. And this dual role is one in which uh, Karatani must engage in a critique of Japan and the world outside, however much these two critiques shift from context to context. My question now is this. What happens to this dual role today? after 20 years of global capitalist consolidation, 20 years after the writing of Architecture's Metaphor and the struggle of trying to perform this dual role, after 20 years of global capitalist consolidation and 20 years of a sustained Japanese economic recession. I think that the cultural difference between Japan and the West, based on an ontology of absence versus presence, is no longer defining or at least we don't need to make it defining in the same way. Kadetani himself seems to perform this shift. He rarely mentions Japan today, and is now arguing, as I said earlier, for a world republic that exceeds nation, state, capital. But I want to suggest that the dual role has not necessarily disappeared, but has rather transformed, now requiring us to negotiate the dual role not between cultural or national difference, but on historical difference. Just as we had to be careful not to neatly translate East and West into the other, today I think the present should not be translated into the future. So you see what I'm doing? I'm, I'm taking that key cross-cultural problematic of how to deal with similarity and difference between East and West, and I'm de-emphasizing it. And I'm putting in its place that the same problematic, but based on temporality and history, in terms of the present and the future. That the same subtlety and sophistication and kind of almost uh, a kind of impossible way of resolving this question of how to think Japan and the West without either exoticizing Japan or without universalizing it, that was always the problem for those of us involved in cross-cultural uh, uh, work, that that problem can be translated into thinking about present and future. Um, uh, so for example, um, the f and, and in many ways, this brings us back full circle to, to the historical trap. 
Uh, now, it's no coincidence that the architect Isazaki Arata wrote the introduction to the English translation of Karatani's book on architecture. Uh, for it's Karatani who mentions that Isazaki is one of the very few architects in Japan who's able to successfully perform this dual role. And in the realm of architecture, that would mean being able to critique Japanese modernity and Japanese architecture while still uh, sustaining, persisting in this will to architecture. Uh, and I want to work through Isozaki's work more carefully now and to try to unpack this dual role as a way ultimately to keep on uh, developing this provocation I'm calling terminal architecture. Now, you might know Isozaki's work uh, um, as well for different reasons, and I think his work has um, made a claim on our attention more these days, especially after the disasters in 2011, tsunami, earthquake, you know, nuclear meltdown. Because, for a couple of reasons. One, Isozaki's always been very interested in ruin, in disaster, um, in decay. And so after the disasters, people have been looking back at Isozaki's work. That's one reason. Two is the 2011 publication of the book by Rem Koolhaas called Project Japan. Some of you might be familiar with that, but Koolhaas himself was very interested in the metabolists and then interviewed all of the living metabolists and integrated into this book. And Isozaki's in that book. But Isozaki always had an ambivalent relationship to the metabolists. Um, he, had, he, was, he was a fellow traveler, but he was quite critical of them. But I think in the West, at least, the interest in, in, um, by Koolhaas and Isozaki is, is one reason why or Cool House and the Metabolist is one reason why people are thinking about Isazaki again. And also for this project called Arc Nova, you saw a picture of that in, in the film, this inflatable, portable structure that Isazaki uh, built. It had its first iteration at the end of last year where it can move into the different disaster zones in Tohoku, where the, where the earthquake and tsunami was. Um, and it can be inflated and it's a sort of community hall or a concert hall and so forth. I want to talk a bit more about these three uh, uh, dimensions of Isozaki's work. Let's, let's begin with the metabolists. The metabolists, 1960s avant-garde architectural movement in Japan. Um, uh, they were set themselves inspired by devastated landscapes, persisting atomic fears after World War II, composed of young architects mostly, and all gathering around probably who at the time is the most well-regarded architect. Japan, Tange Kenzo. The movement, um, founded in 1960, with the publication of this radical manifesto, Metabolism, the Proposals for New Urbanism, developed utopian visions of the future and practices ranging from megastructures to floating cities to artificial land. Critical of Japan's superficial importation of modernism, as well as the nationalist return to nativist ideas of nature, the metabolists were techno-utopians, promoting an accelerated urbanism that could adapt to a changing world. So for example, if they're making a, 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 a domestic home, they might have a, a capsule module for a child. Once the child grows up, that capsule can move to another home of a younger family. Or if we're talking about industry, there could be a factory that would be so flexibly built that if the resources of the town where the factory is changes and that um, factory can be repurposed for a new resource or it can be portably moved to another town where maybe that industry is, is growing and not in decay. Now Isozaki worked with Tange um, and he was, as I said, a fellow traveler of the metabolists, but he never fully endorsed their project. He could not buy into their techno-utopias an underlying desire to manage crisis and preempt the great ruptures of history. Isozaki had a more developed sense of breakdown and ruins, um, one informed by his own theoretical commitment to the negative and a more trenchant critique of capitalist accumulation and mass production. Whereas the met metabolists still envisioned a future that was an extension of the present, one that could be continually regenerated by large-scale urban plans and technological fixes, Isozaki figured the future at once as indelibly imprinted by the great event of Japanese modernity, Hiroshima, and an absolute break from the present and the past. The future is indelibly linked to 
this great trauma, but it's also not continually connected to the future. Uh, or, or the future isn't continually linked to the present and the past. Um, in other words, the future for Isozaki should not be thought of as a progressive historical point. And this division between Isozaki and the metabolist turned on a radically different understanding and conceptualization of time and space. And I'm, I'm not going to go into it too much here, but the character in one part of the film, the Ma, the, the ideogram of the gate, and, and uh, in Japanese aesthetics means something like negative time space, or um, the gap imminent to all things. Or for those of you who might be more familiar with French, uh, with, with, with the French philosopher Bergson, it would be a Bergsonian durée, or maybe I talked about it in terms of Lacan, like the Lacanian real, um, which is to say that the the ma is is a is a way in which time and space are not separated, and there's a and, and Isozaki himself is quite influenced by um, in fact the Buddhist 13th century scholar uh, Dogen and his writing about the way time and space flies. It flies in from the future, it flies in from the past, and so forth. I don't really want to pursue the philosophical implications of this um, term called ma, uh, but what I do want to do is um, think about how uh, Isozaki under performed this conceptualization in, of time and space in a particular um, uh, work of his, and that is what is called Hiroshima ruined again in the future. You saw a, um, a photograph, a still, of that particular project. In the 1996 Venice Biennale, uh, this is one year after the great Kobe earthquake. Uh, Kobe sometimes is um, underappreciated because of the 2011 disasters, but that was a really traumatic event in Japan. Um, uh, what happened in Kobe? Kobe is in the Kansai area, not far from um, Kyoto, Osaka. and. Um, yeah, over 5,000 people died there. And what Isozaki did is he, he produced this exhibit called Architects as Seismographers, um, in which he returned to an earlier work of his called Hiroshima Ruined Again in the Future, which he made in 1969. Now that you saw the picture of. What you, what you saw in that picture was a, um, a photograph of Hiroshima days after it was bombed. Overlaid on top of that were metabolist megastructures that themselves were already in decay. So, in other words, there's a kind of um, combination of different times here. You have the, the Hiroshima event, but you also have what at the time, in 1969, was being still, even though it's the end of the movement, it, it was being fantasized about the great possibilities of, a, of these urban megastructures. But Isozaki had already seen what was being dreamed of in the present as, in de as decaying in the future. Um, now, why is that important? Um, well, for Isozaki, the cities that were now to be built by the metabolists, the ones they were thinking of in the, in the 60s, were already ruined. Um, and, 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 and what, Isoz what was inspiring Isozaki was a very distasteful similarity between the rhetoric of the metabolists and the rhetoric of the East Asian prosperity sphere, um, great utopias uh, built in the name of the emperor and, and the empire. Um, instead of substituting one grand project for the other, or of retreating into demoralized inactivity, Isozaki explains that he could only hope to depict the trauma itself. So that's his way of, that's why Katatani celebrated this dual role. He didn't, he, he didn't um, recoil into silence. He didn't just um, uh, hone his critique of the metabolist, but he had a way of, of sustaining this will to architecture. Uh, and that's in this depiction of the trauma itself. So in the case of Hiroshima of 1945, it's, it's understanding not just the trauma of the past, but the trauma of the future. So what's at stake in understanding trauma as coming from the future. It, it seems somewhat counterintuitive, because when we usually think about trauma, certainly in a psychoanalytic mode, we understand it as this event that happened in the past that somehow is driving a certain repetition of symptoms in the present and is containing <coughs> the possibilities 
for the future. Right? Uh, but if the trauma itself is coming from the future, then what, are, what, what does that close down and open up? And I think there's lots of different directions that we could go here. We could go in more into a psychoanalytic implication and, um, and think about how the subject and trauma de-anchored from the past might produce a different project for the, um, the work of, of psychoanalysis and thinking about personal change, and I'm going to talk more about that on Thursday. We can think about the aesthetic dimension um, in which, and here you might want to think about the Frankfurt School or others who are understanding aesthetic, a certain aesthetic invention as flashing an impossible future, one that, one, one that can't be realized within the present constraints. Um, or we can think about a more directly political um, uh, 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 implication of this trauma coming from the future. And I would say in many ways this is what Karatani is doing in the new work, which is to say if, if, you know, if, if what Karatani is doing is a sort of Marxist critique of Marxists' understanding of change. That's to say if the usual way is that once you overcame capital, then the state and nations would wither away. Karatani's arguing, no, 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 actually what happens is the state and the nation come back and recuperate those interventions into capital, and it just keeps reproducing. You have, to, you have to work on all three at the same time because they're connected like so many Baronian rings. Um, okay, that's, that's the, the Karatani, if you're, those of you interested in that specifically, we, could, we can talk more about it at later times. Um, but what I'd rather do here is... Um, think about uh, ways in which Isozaki performed this, this idea of trauma coming from the future in one of his projects, in particular, the, the Arc Nova project that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so in line with this spirit, Isozaki, together with the artist Anish Kapoor, produced this impermanent, you saw it was that red structure, human heart-like um, structure that inflates right on top of the rubble of the past, and is always ready to be inflated on top of the rubble of the future. And we should remember, remember that there are many different disasters that happened on March 11, 2011, and that continue to happen. And here I'm not just thinking about the difference between an earthquake, a tsunami, and a um, and, and nuclear fallout. Uh, but I'm thinking about the different temporal and spatial scales of disaster. So for example, the earthquake and tsunami directly affected those living in the towns and villages in the Tohoku region of Japan. We know that. Uh, slightly differently, the nuclear meltdown has affected not only those in the immediate vicinity of the Fukushima nuclear reactors, but the whole country in terms of the potential contamination of the water and food supply, let alone those outside of Japan. Moreover, the temporality of the nuclear disaster is different from the temporality of the earthquake and the tsunami. The danger and damage, for example, of the nuclear fallout will occur over the long term with fewer immediate effects. These different but overlapping temporalities of disaster, short-term destruction and long-term threat, get at a fundamental challenge. How, for example, we can directly engage the immediacy of an event, such as the practical destruction wrought by the earthquake to both people and the physical landscape, while at the same time attend to ver the various historical, future, and meta-contexts of the immediate situation. Isozaki responds to this challenge by producing a kind of terminal architecture, one that ship shape shift shapes from nothing to something and back to nothing again. It not only can be mobile mobilized toward different towns and villages affected by the disasters, but it can be mobilized toward the future, toward future disasters. It promises, I think, to be one of the more successful failures, as these attempts are always destined to fail at escaping the paradox of the historical trap. Now, I realize that the provocation of terminal architecture is still hard to grasp. So what I want to do now is, I, I, don't, I don't want Arc Nova to serve as a distraction to that, um, because the, provo the, 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 pra the practices are just going to reduce what I think the provocation can become. Uh, but what I want to do is just more specifically draw out some of the larger principles of terminal architecture um, before turning to another event. Terminality is neither a fetish for grand finishes 
nor a nihilistic animosity toward what presently exists. Rather, it's a way of positioning the future as that which already exists inside the present, while at the same time as that which is radically separate from the present. In the already dead, I talk about death as representing the pure form of this double logic, and I explore its potential. That is, the potential of reclaiming our death and deaths itself as an inspiration for opening up to the new. When death, however, is mobilized against us by the state, it is done so as to block the potential, either by one, terrorizing us with the painful reality of it, thus convincing us that the only way that we can manage death is by playing by the rules, or two, coercing us to ignore or repress death so as to, once again, keep us playing by the rules. The question at hand is what role space and architecture play in this regard? And this leads me now um, to a group of younger architects and designers in the way that they're um, uh, producing in Japan in particular. But before then, I have a slight detour, um, and that is to a place called Hashima, an uninhabited Japanese island of about 15 acres that for decades was the most densely populated place on Earth before all humans were subtracted. I understand now that it was in the most recent James Bond film, so people are more familiar with it, but you saw some of the uh, images of, of Hashima in the film. From the late 19th century, when Mitsubishi began to tap the coal reserves under the sea bottom, Hashima housed, sometimes forcibly, over 5,000 workers and their families, and was equipped with everything from, a, from schools to a cemetery. In 1974, Mitsubishi closed the facility, requiring every last resident to move off of the island. From then until now, no one has lived on Hashima while its various structures and human remnants remain and progressively decay. Part ghost town, part dreamscape, part science experiment, Hashima presents a tempting site on which to obsess, to speculate, to imagine, to fantasize about the world without human beings. Why has such a site and the thought of the sudden subtraction of human beings generated such widespread interest? Is it that the imagining that imagining the planet without us, its redemption, its recuperation, its liberation, functions to assuage our guilt over all of our toxic practices? Is it a grand gesture of human humiliation? Or its opposite, another anthropocentric conceit in order to remind us that we are and always have and will be the masters of our universe, which in this case means mastering the very analysis of our own aftermath. Whatever we may make of this booming genre, we can be sure that it provides crucial insights into our current ideological field. Think about the structure of the after-human narrative. A radically different world without us, all humans are suddenly subtracted, is the formal equivalent to its apparent opposite, an identical world with us. With this, we have now reached the dominant ideological frame of capitalism. One side that encloses the future by figuring it solely on the order of dystopian terminality, and the other that encloses the future by figuring it as the identical extension of the chronic present. Wholesale apocalypse or more of the same? Pick your poison. But the real work of this ideological squeeze is to foreclose, to make unthinkable, the utopian other to the structure, namely, a radical, radically different world with us. In the early 1990s, Frederick Jameson commented on the lack of a revolutionary imagination in his now famous statement, often echoed by Slavoj Žižek, that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. The force, and I think humor, of this thought momentarily revealed the depoliticized nature of late capitalist societies. We're always lulled by the latest blockbuster dystopia as a way to stay asleep to the actually existing possibilities of radical change. But today, the dialectical shock of Jameson's statement seems to have worn off. The joke's no longer funny. The charge has weakened, I think, for two reasons. First, because the end of the world, or at least the end of the species, coming before the end of capitalism, isn't just another apocalyptic fantasy, but an actually existing scientific possibility. 
The second, and less depressing, and this is where the talk turns and starts to get more upbeat, so don't worry, uh, is because the end of capitalism is no longer unthinkable. In fact, this was Kamatani's, or, 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 that, that today, the, the end of capitalism is no longer unthinkable. This is the argument that I make in a book called After Globalization. Um, which came out around three years ago. And it's this very simple argument. It's saying that there's so much, in terms of the globalization debate, there's so much obsession of when it began. Was it the 1970s with the oil crisis? Was it after the post-World War II, 45? Was it the colonial project? Was it 14th century trade routes? When did it begin? Historians love to think about when globalization began. And my question was simply, when did globalization end? And the fact that that question never was asked within the globalization discor discourse indicated to me that that was the primary ideological effect of globalization, which was that it, you could think about everything except the end of globalization itself. I mean, all you could think about was an apocalyptic end of worlds, but you couldn't really think about a transformation. Um, and, and you could track this discursively when globalization as a term actually came into being. It was in the early 1990s. In, in, in English, in North America. There was a discursive struggle over what was going to win the day. Was it going to be global capitalism, late capitalism, flexible accumulation, deindustrialized capitalism, information capitalism? But the key to all of the, that discursive struggle was capitalism was still a word and a category that was part of the name that was describing and trying to explain these processes. When globalization won the discursive day, what happened was also the dropping out of any conversation of capitalism as being a historical formation that not only had a coming into being at some point, wherever you want to mark it, 14th century, 15th century, 16th century later, but also will necessarily have a going out of being. After 2008's great financial crisis, what we've noticed, uh, if anything, maybe nothing that's necessarily significantly has changed, but that capitalism is back on the table for conversation. When that has happened, a reconfiguration of what's possible and impossible now is spreading into so many different realms. And I, I think that Karatani makes this similar argument in, a, in an article that I know that Seiji translated into English um, about the difference between the Kobe earthquake in 1995 and the earthquake in 2011. It's a very simple and elegant article, but it'll take us back to Japan to, to really particularize this um, even more. He's basically saying that in 1995, it's only a couple of years since the recession has been going on in Japan. People didn't really realize how serious the recession was. When the earthquake happened in Kobe, the leaders took it as an opportunity, a type of shock doctrine, to then um, uh, dismantle what was remaining of the Japanese welfare state, cradle to grave protection, other kinds of lifetime employment, and in, uh, uh, implement various neoliberal reforms and knit Japan much more into the global economy, let alone rewrite its constitution and so forth, attempt to do that. Um, uh, so in the name of dealing with this great disaster, it, um, uh, the earthquake was used to, to, to implement the neoliberal reforms as a solution to this. But in 2011, after the earthquake in Tohoku, Karatani's argument is that can't, it can't be a solution anymore, a kind of economic uh, neoliberalism, which then has opened up the conversation not just to more precarity, which we know is the case in Japan, but to new ways of really thinking what could come next or what can happen in Japan. It's an actually a rather enlivening new possibility in Japan at this moment. So I think the, the, what I, what I want to get at now as I move toward a conclusion um, is, is I want to think about how some of the younger Japanese architects and designers are working within this context in which capitalism is back on the table of critique. And I hope this will tie also together um, some of the principles um, pro and, and the provocation of terminal architecture. OK, um, and, and I've showed you some clips of, of, of the work of some of these designers and architects, um, which is to say, though, that what I want to do with this is I want to read these architects a bit more politically than they probably understand themselves. This is to say that I want to understand them against the grain, less as fetishizing some Japanese peculiarity, and more as, however unconsciously, invoking a different future, not to mention a different idea of the future itself. Of course, we could think about them in terms of Japanese aesthetics, um, and this orientalizing instinct is not altogether wrong, 
But when we do this, we usually end up learning precisely what we already know. And this invariably turns into a hyper aestheticization of the political and the everyday. And so I want to try something else with these, with these um, younger practitioners. You saw three of them, Atelier Bow Wow, that's uh, made up of Tsukumoto Yoshiharu and Kaijima uh, Momoyo. Uh, you also had the work of uh, Fujimoto So and then uh, Ishigami Junya. Atelier Bow Wow produced the idea of void metabolism. Uh, I should say that what all three of them, how all three of these different practices position themselves is against the metabolist movements of the 1960s. So that's reading this. You know, the, the earlier discussion about the metabolisms, the mega structures, the techno utopias are going to be important for us. Um, so let's just quickly, quickly, too, way too quickly, go through these three um, and, the, and the projects that I showed in the film. First, the idea of void metabolism. Unlike the core metabolism of the older movement, which was organized vertically, bundling lifelines surrounded by detachable capsules, all of which would be carried out through a concentration of power and capital. The regeneration of the city for Atelier Bow Wow would be organized not around the core, but around the void. The gaps between buildings that would be creatively developed by individual families, micro-neighborhood movements, and so forth. The different future here, in this case, exists in between what presently exists. Second, Fujimoto So, his idea of primitive future. Primitive future is looking back before architecture for example, when a place to be was not yet differentiated. That's why Fujimoto is very interested in the forest and the cave in particular as opposed to the nest. Um, uh, when a house was like a forest and corresponded less to one's needs than to one's possibilities. In this case, for Fujimoto then, the future is understood as right inside of our deep history. Third, Ishigami Junya. He's the one who had the cuboid balloon that was for the 2007 exhibit called The Space for Your Future at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. Ishigami constructed that huge balloon. It's five stories high, waves over a ton. It's made of aluminum trusses and panels filled with helium, and it sort of floats sublimely in air, just surrounded by the walls around it. And when Ishigami was asked about it, he said he was actually less interested in the object itself and much more interested in the negative space between the object and the walls, and how that shifted tall to narrow to triangular. Um, uh, and so in this case, Ishigami, Ishigami wanted to explore the creative becomings of the negative space that existed right inside of the present. Now, in all three of these practices, the future, radical otherness, is that which exists imminently in the negative space of the space. Each makes something with the intention that when explored or lived in becomes something else, changing us in the process. Again, I'm not interested in reading this work as a fresh renewal of Japanese aesthetics, but rather as politicized interventions into global capitalism. Interventions that face different limitations and possibilities than those at different historical mo moments. And it's for this reason why I do not wholly accept these younger architects' criticisms of the past generation of architects, and why I think we need to be careful in our celebration of this new and compelling work. So now I'm getting to the, the real conclusion and, and, a, and, a, and a move on, on these architects. The smaller, delicate, and what we might call imminent architecture of Atelier Bow Wow, Fujimoto So, and Ishigami Junya itself clearly influenced by a hybrid combination of Buddhist aesthetics, the global traffic of post-structuralist thought, and a new anti-capitalist dispensation, effectively challenges our present, but it is still entrapped in it. Their allergy to mega-projects, to the totalization of power and capital, to the somewhat vulgar utopias of the older metabolists, leads me to question whether their own work won't end up reinforcing the larger capitalist logic. Of course, this could be said about anything today, my own work, of course, included. But I do wonder whether our transformed situation in which the durability and permanence of capitalism is back on the table for question, and when capitalism is no longer naturalized as the only game in town, now requires new risks with alternative megacities and utopian projects for which 
the older metabolists were known. So as I suggested in regard to the medical and the political, I wonder what's at stake when we give up on the classic categories of cure and revolution and invest all of our energy in non-totalizing cultural practices or medical practices. So now I have a third analogy to establish. Cure is to management as revolution is to reform, as the metabolists of old is to the anti-metabolists today. The point isn't to favor one over the other, but to strategically know when to invoke one over the other. And just as I wish to reclaim the more radical dimensions of cure and revolution today, as management and reform are uncritically celebrated, I wonder if this wish should extend to reclaim the old-style metabolist utopias at the very moment when they are challenged by so many elegant interventions. For now, I'll leave that open, and rather than choose between totality versus singularity, imminent versus transcendental critique, core versus void metabolism, or all old metabolists versus younger anti-metabolists, I'll conclude first with the simple answer, yeah, yeah. And second, with one final visual coda, and it's just one minute. between the um the importance of temporality right. and the ephemerality, I think. Yeah. Temporality but if you're talking about in the film itself, in the film yeah. in the short film. Yeah, itself. in the form of representation yeah. of it and then of the thing. No, I mean I think in many ways this is a good question because it is the problem of representation. And I've been thinking I know a lot of uh, colleagues um, what as intellectuals, the certain ways by which we express and form and realize ideas. Um, and in a way that is somewhat uh, challenging of a, of a um, PowerPoint model to some degree. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think, I think, you know, the only way I could talk about it my, myself is that I, uh, I'm, always working with the problem of um, the relation between theory and practice and that those are 
that, that theorizing hits a limit that only sort of practical work can open up. At the same time, practice hits its limit, only that rigorous thinking can sometimes open up. And, and the only way that I can really get at that, there's no resolution to that problem of praxis, um, but in how I make things and how, and how the ideas come out. And so it just seemed, you know, for me, this has been a form I've been working with where I'll start with a film and work through ideas, and it's, it's that they're happening simultaneously. So I, when I'm making, when I'm, when I'm work, doing the work, I have all these images, and then I know that you need to see them, but I feel, you know, strongly that if I show them during the talk, I'm going to reduce them. I don't believe in the example. I'm against the example, actually. The example as now clarifying what I mean. I mean, I know we want that. I want that. We all want that clarity. But I do think that that many times cancels out the, the, the vitality of the ideas itself. And, 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 and so what I'm looking for is a way in which the images, the text, can have a certain autonomy to the ideas. They don't, they don't, they don't serve the thinking, and the thinking doesn't serve the building, but they're really working together in some way. And, and so I wouldn't say there's a con conscious stylistic um, aspect to the film as, that's connected maybe to the beautiful and compelling work of Ishigami or, or Fujimoto. Um, but I think that what we see, you know, is the breakdown of the different um, spaces that we occupy as thinkers and makers, and you know, you have the filmmaker and the film theorist and the architect, the architect. I mean, it's different in architecture. I think architecture has been one of the better disciplines to bring those things together. But in the humanities, generally, um, that rarely happens. I mean, um, uh, you, you know, students get PhDs in literature, that doesn't mean creative writing. They get PhDs in film, and rarely it's either production or history theory, um, and so forth. And, and I don't want to fetishize the fact that we should, you know, you need to make things in order to understand them. But I think that those divisions are already arbitrary, and that, and that the, the shaking them up is, um, is I think, important. And, and I think Isozaki, in many ways, is probably exemplary, because in some way, I find his history and, and, and theoretical interventions into art, Japanese studies, into architecture, into philosophy is more compelling than his buildings a lot of times um, for what he's done. And, and, and I think he'd be very, he, I think he always says he considers himself a writer first and foremost. Um, and he thinks of maybe writing quite capaciously. But still, I, I respect that move, which isn't to sort of denigrate those who are. The, you know, the, the non-practitioners, um, in many ways. I, I'm not sure if that, if that gets to it, but I, I guess, you know, and also you'll see this for those of the students who are going to be in the seminar, or maybe think a little bit about Sans Soleil. I think Chris Marker is probably one of the great artists, poets, philosophers, political figures to do that, who's able to really, you know, bring together um, journalism, and also um, a history of ideas, philosophy, and shake them up and, and um, somehow have them destabilize the arbitrary divisions between the ways in which we think 
withdrawal movements, right? where withdrawal is an activity by, say, young, you know, some people connected to Occupy were talking about withdrawal, which isn't an apathy, and it's not necessarily a, um, a, uh, an act in which one is being apathetic or non-engaged, but it's a different form of, of engagement. And, you know, I mean, I guess maybe to, to complicate matters even more, not to do anything is to do something. Right? I mean, you know, that, that is an act, act in and of itself. So, I mean, that's the dialectical aspect, side of the game, but sort of Buddhist understanding of, of nothing. Um, uh, but I, th I think it's, you know, it's probably the first step to some kind of critical thinking is to realize, well, maybe if I didn't say anything or I shut up right now, something would open up. Or if I stopped thinking in that way, I would actually be able to think something. If I, you know, if I was able to, to, to just not keep filling myself up, but to evacuate myself of something, it makes space, and that is what, on some level, freedom is and, and possibility. So I, I think it's, it's important. And, and, you know, I mean, I think that the persist. I think why Katatani liked Isozaki is because he, 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 he said he did persist in this will to architecture. And, 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 and he, it would have been a bit easier if he would have just moved into a kind of demoralized or hypercritical inactivity. But that isn't also a solution. But again, I just, and finally, maybe this gets to the last little quote there about the historical trap is, there's no, I, I wouldn't want to prescribe an answer to that question. It, it, to me, I, I'm just a historical material. You know, I want to say, well, what are the pro Today, what is needed? Does that mean inactivity? Does that mean a kind of emphasis of the void? Uh, not, or does it mean a certain, maybe, um, uh, hype, uh, a hyper imitation of something or over exaggeration of, of, of something as critique? That's going to be different at different moments in time and different contexts as well. I think I think I think that is really in line with um, Isozaki's use and appropriation of Ma and and Ma as flying in from the future. With ben Yamin. I mean, for me, the thinker who I would want to invoke at this time, even more than Benjamin, would be Ernst Bloch, who really is probably one of the great thinkers of the future at a moment when, from aesthetics to politics to psychoanalysis, it's really kind of um, re reopening up the past or attempting to shake loose, de-anchor the past. And, and I think that sort of attention toward the future in a more an even explicit way for Bloch. Um, but I, I think I think so. I think I think certainly I mean, there's this crystallization of something that can become which isn't a destiny, it's not some, you know, it's not necessarily going to become, going to come in. Or you, we could transfer to the whole Deleuzean vocabulary and say this is virtuality. And the virtual is this thing that's coming from the future that is shaping the present but doesn't exist in the present. It's not actually here. And, and that kind of way of understanding temporality. Um, so, yes, I mean, I certainly, you know, I, on one hand, I don't want to collapse it and say, oh, well, really, everyone's thinking about these things. And so I do want to keep the historical context of how Isozaki is thinking about it. And he really does go back to Golian um, uh, to think about questions of temporality in terms of his practice. Um, uh, but yeah, I also don't want to particularize it and say this is a Japanese thing. So because clearly we have these examples.
so I guess my question is, is terminal architecture something you see that can be put into practice, or are you mainly seeing it as a heuristic device? Like, I, mean, I think you mentioned that yeah. donut-shaped thing. Like, maybe it's architecture that involves kind of self-critique that foreshadows its own destruction. I mean, like, what do you see between what's being used as a heuristic device and what can actually be put into practice? Yeah, that's, that's a that's a, a very good question. I mean, the, I'm very interested in palliation as well. It's one of my kind of interests, my key. It's inspiring for me on a practical level, what happens in changes within palliative care, dealing with terminality. But as a as an idea, as a generator of thinking, it's very interesting. And, and it seems like all oh, terminal architecture, you know, and I, I was working with some architects who were building a new palliative care unit in Canada, Toronto. Right? And it seemed as if, oh, that might be one application to, to the work, right? How, but no, really, that's not. I mean, I, I, as I, I, I kind of left the project, I realized that it, it somehow was containing the ideas, so that the, the ideas, although were very much connected to questions of what does one do at the end, when the usual, what, what we cling to for possibility or cure might not longer be possible, and then what kind of can open up at that end point. And there's a lot of again, very fascinating and, and, and brilliant work being done in the field. But I think it's it's more of a um, it's it's more of a provocation that would find itself being worked out in the most unlikely places. You know, um, not it's not not. Yeah, more of a driver for thinking about it once history and the containments of, of the present. But really, I mean, on, on another level, being able to allow our imaginations to run wild in a science fictional way and have permission to do that. Um, uh, and terminal architecture is, is sort of like an architecture of the future, of an impossible future that, of course, by the time we make it and imagine it, it's not the terminal architecture anymore because we're containing it with our imagination and what's possible. And it always has to remain as this almost ideal that is impossible. But that's not nothing, right? The, the impossible, the thing we can't do is still um, shaping what we do do. The impossible shapes what's possible. That would be, you know, overly abstract way of putting it. Uh, so I'm not so sure yet what, if it's a heuristic device, if it's not, like I know, I knew, I thought, oh, we're all right, I'll start finding buildings that I think get close to this. And I thought, oh, that's gonna, that's not good. Because then we'll just talk about the building. And I mean, Arc Nova was something I had already been thinking about, and I, I hesitated to use it. Um, uh, so I don't want to call it terminal architecture, but I think it can help us um, uh, uh, shake up, shake it up so that something can happen. And, and that's all really the idea is, is for. Uh, thanks.